Thank you for joining us today in the second of a series of two um, conversations around money and spirituality. Uh, I'm Jack O'Keefe, and while I'm a spiritual teacher, I, I um, spent a fair bit of time digging into the money issue. And I ended up qualifying as a, a financial coach last year. Um, but I totally bow down to the co-presenter, co-facilitator of today, Cleana Lira, who is in London. She's there with the blue top. She's going to speak about herself in a moment. And Cleana is a financial advisor. So it's her day job. And she's driven to marrying the worlds of spiritual value system and financial Mm, information, financial literacy at the same time. Kleena, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Jack, Jack, may I, I have a technical issue, if, you know, if I may. Yeah. Uh, you wanted me to record it to my computer. Yeah. The recording button, because somebody else is recording it to the cloud, it doesn't allow me to record. It just says stop recording, and I don't want to do that. So. Shall we just go with the cloud? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. We'll just hope for the best. We, we, it's been totally Murphy's Law with technical stuff all morning. So here we are. It's still happening. So it's good. Back to you, Cleona. Thanks, Phil. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Cleona. I'm based in London and I run a financial advisory practice. Don't judge me. I know you're all spiritual people, so you don't judge. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm very interested in, and I specialize in sustainable investing. Um, my accent is from India. So I was born in India. And um, I'm very interested also in the psychology of money. And um, of course, the spirituality of money in the sense of how do we use money when we don't feel separate from others? You know, how can we use money to serve life? I'm also very influenced by nonviolent communication and the work of Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. And later on today, I'll talk to you. Yay. <laughs> I'll talk to you about the most powerful thing that I've learned that helps me in my relationship with money. And that's um, shadow work, or I also call it reclamation of identity. Over to you, Jack. You're muted, Jack. <laughs> Thanks, Kleena. We're going to put up one slide, which is a question in the chat box. So click in the chat box. Renata, can you pop up the first slide? And finish this sentence. First thing that comes to mind. Don't edit, don't try to be spiritual, be raw, be honest, be open. Money is. Don't look for a politically correct answer. I want you to dig deep and be honest. Energy, energy, useful, a token representing value of work, difficult is a mirage, flow of energy. Necessary. Essential. No other offerings. Huh, better to have than not have freedom, fun, abundance. Thank you, folks. Stability. Mm. Choice.
Okay, Renata, can you bring us back to the, the other screen where we can all see each other? Thank you. And so the thing is, it's pieces of paper, really, isn't it? You know? So let's see which, which, which of these, I didn't have any sterling lying around in any cash box here. It's paper right now in front of you. Are you more attracted to one than the other because it's more familiar to you, one currency? And so any idea of what this paper is, right now it's just paper. Any idea of what it is is a projection from our own minds. And it's got to do with our conditioning, our ideas, how we were reared, and we project meaning onto it. And it's completely subjective. Kleena, do you want to say more about this? Yeah, I just want to invite you to type in the chat any observations or any interesting reactions you had to the responses of other people in the one word response about money. Do you notice any kind of pattern or do you notice any kind of, or if you have some resonance or um, did anybody notice anything? Similar, yeah. There were some similarities. There were quite a lot of positive sort of, you know, freedom and abundance and fun, um, but there were some uh, responses, not many I noticed, um, like that money is difficult and, um, you know, a mirage. Um, so basically, you know, um, when I speak to people about money, generally as a financial advisor, but, and, and my, my audience tends to be biased because they are generally people who don't want to deal with their money for whatever reason, and they'd rather um, have it to me. Uh, sometimes people have like, um, you know, the avoidance thing with money and they are literally making their, their, their hands like this and their actions like, like when they speak about money, they're pushing it away. And sometimes we can have these negative stories about money, like money is evil, money is dirty, money is suffering. Money is painful, depending on, you know, if we've had lots of conflicts in our families about money. And then um, sometimes people also have these like positive stories about money. And in, in that, and when, like for me, money is freedom, you know, money is fun, money is abundance. Uh, I see a, a lot of people say money is stability. So if there is a positive story about money, that's also interesting and that affects how we relate to money. And then sometimes we can be confused. So the actions can be like, like that, but also, you know, like that. So if we have a positive story about money, then maybe we, we want more of money because we want more of that stability or more of that freedom. If we have a negative story about money or lots of negative stories about money, then those also drive us and we might have sort of avoidance. And then sometimes it's a bit like a washing machine. It's a bit like, um, I'm not sure I'll have it, but then I'll get rid of it. So, uh, and these are very clear in hand gestures. And uh, when Jack talks about the archetypes, we can delve a little bit deeper. But what I'd invite you to do is just to be curious, you know, about where, where you are, where you think you are. Renata, if you can pop up the next slide, please. These are how the topics that were shared, because the, at the last webinar, we thought we'll go into a discussion, but what happened was that everybody's ideas were quite diverse from the previous speakers, and it didn't devolve into a specific conversation. And I think that's actually very interesting in itself, because the topics are divided into three colors here. The orange one, it's almost a third, third, third. The third, the orange one is the landscape, the broader societal confusion around money. The green one is our inner work. We need to do our own shadow work. I want to look at my own stuff. And the red one is 
money in our profession. And let's talk about that. I'm glad to say it's the larger one because that's what brings us all together. We're all here in some, some capacity as spiritual leaders or friends of spiritual leaders. They're, the three are interwoven. It's very significant how diverse it is because the topic of money, it's cultural. It seems to be global. And so looking at it within a spiritual sector, we're going to have to go to the green section to see what are our own personal relationships with money and our beliefs around money. If we're going to do, we are going to do a little bit of that work now on ourselves, because that's what influences how we show up in society. That's what influences how we show up as, as spiritual leaders and what our relationship with money is in our work. If we charge for it, if we donate from it, for sure. The belief systems we have around the role of money in our profession has to do with our own relationship with it. And we need to like unpack that a little bit so that we can be as clear and as transparent and as in, in, in integrity as much as we can be. Next slide, Renata. Thank you. We did a, a, a deep dive into what was available out there looking at the overlap between spiritual communities, spiritual leaders, and, and from leaders to gurus, the whole spectrum. I'm looking at leadership, whether people are connected to a lineage or whether they are uh, independent spiritual leaders. So I'm looking at an encompassing word there. Spiritual leadership and money. And where does it overlap? There was not one a paper, as in like a PhD research document. We couldn't find any um, dedicated newspaper article that solely spoke about the interface between um, improprieties with money and spirituality. Not one was dedicated. And I have a personal theory why, but I think the New York Times mentioned it here. This is, this is the only thing in the New York Times around money. Not all of the recent scandals have been sexual. Some have involved financial impropriety or the physical abuse of students. And I think because there are so many areas that we need to do better, as, better in, with regard to as spiritual leaders, that money kind of goes down the ladder in terms of what needs to be addressed. That's no reason to ignore it. And that's what we're doing here today. Let's not ignore it. Let's get this part right, because if it's not as egregious as other things that happen, surely it's easier to tidy it up. One would imagine. I don't know. We're just digging into it. The second tense quote that I've pulled out tends to be an approach that is widely shared among spiritual communities. Don't worry about the money. The money will look after itself. Interestingly enough, Okay, this, is, this was a quote that a seeker reported that she heard over and over, or that he heard over and over again from the leader of Japa Meditation. It was the Irish wing of it, interestingly enough. The only court case that I saw anywhere around spirituality and money was in connection with the same organization, Japa Meditation where a husband invested 300,000 euro into the leader of Japa meditation without his wife's consent. She brought him to the high court. It ended in mediation, 300,000. He took it out of pension funds and he took it out of their shared business because he said that his guru needed it. That's the only place it came close to something legal. But that attitude, don't worry about the money, the money will look after itself. That's rife. I've met that so many times. Money should go around the guru. Money isn't a problem. Don't make it a problem. Let's work on donation so that it's like at arm's length from us. Let's not face it. Let's not dig it up. And then, you know, if you saw, if you saw the, the John of the Cross series on Netflix, the, um, the documentary that exposed that uh, Brazilian healer who is in jail, he's on house arrest now, I believe. In that documentary, the accountant, their personal accountant spoke about 
large refuse plastic bags being filled with cash and then being stuffed into the attic because they didn't know what to do with the amount of cash that they made. As the documentary went on, of course, the horrendous sexual abuse and rape that happened to over 100 women, um, which, which ended up putting them in jail, became the major story. And it should do because it's so much more egregious. Is that money still sitting in the attic in an abandoned ashram in, in Brazil? I don't know. So, so invariably, that seems to be what's, what happens. Even in Japa, Ireland, the money issue got swallowed because, because Japa, Ireland closed, Japa Meditation closed because of uh, just over 30 women alleged sexual abuse from the leader. And so they often tend to be on the one trajectory, financial abuse, sexual abuse. Those ones tend to become stories. But financial abuse, when it's on its own, is hidden. And we'd like to kind of see this is a thing in itself. And it, it often exists because us as spiritual leaders are not clear enough ourselves about our own relationship with money. And there might be nothing at all that is um, untoward about our relationship with sex or sexuality or sexual partners. But let's not ignore the money piece. And so looking at our own purposes here today, Cleona mentioned about archetypes. There's a very simple archetype that we're going to do right now. Renata, if you'd like to scoot on to the next, the next one. This, this archetypal um, system is from um, T. Harv Eckers, and he divides it into four. If you like this system, Abacus, abacus.com have a, a system of archetypes that's much more in depth. There's uh, eight options there, but it's an interesting way to find out what am I, what am I leaning into? Where might I start digging into my shadow? Kleena, would you like to, to explain these? As you can see, I have some text there. And so have a look at the spender needing to be seen as kind and generous, spending to gain status or approval. Yeah, um, archetypes are one way of sort of classifying, you know, your money type. Um, certainly there are people who shun money and they renunciate, you know, like it's very noble. Um, and I see it also in spiritual communities and nonviolent communication communities too, where it's sort of noble and beneath me to deal with money. And money sometimes becomes like an awkward topic. The spender is somebody who um, um, I've met. I've met people in in money workshops. I run a lot of money workshops, and I enjoy doing group work because it's a very interesting way of finding resonance and quickly getting to the heart of the topic and being able to do some body work. And sometimes there are spenders who you know, there's nothing wrong with spending money if it's a if it's a compulsive thing. Uh, and you're doing it to seek status and approval and you can't stop. Uh, there are people who are absolutely bankrupt and they still can't stop. They're still buying rounds in the pub. They're the first one to their condition. They, they, they can't break the habit, even though it's harming them. Uh, and that would be when an archetype is sort of out of balance. Uh, savers are people who feel, I think the way this is being described is it's more of a contraction. It's more of a scarcity undertone rather than um, somebody who's diligently, responsibly saving and taking care of themselves, which is a good thing to do, of course. And, um, and the avoider. Money creates conflicts or causes problems. I've met plenty of people who've parted from relationships and they have such a strong belief, like I will never fight about money, that they leave their money in the divorce settlement, they leave the houses and they just start from ground zero again because of this belief. And so um, my work... Uh, that I'm really interested in is uh, this reclamation of identities. And I do need to mention the source of my work, the person whom I've learned from, and it's a guy called Peter, Co uh, Peter Koenig. He's based in Switzerland. He's actually British. And um, he came up with this system called, uh, the, uh, you know, to, to look at money and it's called identity reclamation. I call it shadow work, but you know, uh, ultimately identity is who we see 
ourselves as who we believe we are. And as Jack mentioned, you know, that comes from conditioning, circumstances, family, um, religion, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately that, um, <laughs> these qualities that we project onto money are very powerful and we underestimate how powerful they are. And I call them, um, Peter Koenig actually wrote a book. It's, it's not a great book, I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> it's called 30 Lies About Money. In the sense, it's a good book, but but you know there are there are other books uh, that delve much better into shadow work. Uh, it's also out of print, so it'll be expensive, and I don't want you spending money unnecessarily. But in the book, he calls he calls the book thirty lies about money. So lies are basically these stories that we believe money to be. You know, for example, for me, because I grew up in India, and this is very real for me as a child. I couldn't understand why there were people. And I grew up in the 80s, you know, before globalization, before India became this um, mammoth economic machine that it is today. I couldn't understand why there were kids my age walking around with red, malnourished hair, completely naked, begging for food. I was tortured by that. Um, I, I saw lots of things that I think children shouldn't see that make children feel uncomfortable about inequality. And I... I have I had this belief that people who charge a lot of money are greedy, money grabbing bastards, you know, and um, I had to reclaim that part of my identity because when I started my own business, and I don't mean this in a judgmental way, I really had to allow my greedy parts, you know, to be included because there are times when I had to take on a client and the client could afford the higher end of my fees. And I had to be greedy in the moment, but I couldn't. I would charge all my clients the lowest possible fee because I came from the compulsion that I couldn't be greedy. And in my family, it wasn't okay. If I went, you know, to a neighbor's house, we had this, we had feasts in Goa, like it was Roman Catholic and Mother Mary's statue went from house to house. And sometimes, you know, um, the, the neighbor served you like, like um, very nutritious snacks like chickpeas but one time there was this slightly rich neighbor and she had biscuits and I was eight or nine and the biscuits came round round one I helped myself round two I went for it round three they offered it to me I was like what's wrong with the third biscuit I'll take it I went back home afterwards and my grandmother was like what's wrong with you like why did you have to be so greedy are you not getting food at home this looks so bad you know and it, it's cultural like it's weird, we had these things in Goa where you had to leave a little bit of cold drink in the glass to show that you weren't so desperate that you drank everything. So the greedy parts of me were not allowed to thrive and I had to learn to embrace it. Now, me be being greedy allows me to also, uh, you know, like take on clients who can't afford me and do it for free. So, so I have the range now, whereas before I was coming from compulsion. The main reason I'm telling you the story is to tell you how the projections work. And um, maybe we can get off this slide because it would be nice to see people. <laughs> and um, the, the important thing that I learned about money is that we project these qualities onto money. We animate money with these energetic qualities that are, that are ours. We can be all of these qualities. I can be greedy and generous and ethical and unethical and a capitalist, extortionate, whatever, you know, I can free up those parts because sometimes in order to run a business, I have to hire people. I have to be able to also sometimes fire people. And if I can't allow those parts to breathe, it limits me. Um, these qualities that we start animating onto money, uh, we do because Money is so abstract. So it's a beautiful, beautiful recipient of our deepest uh, 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 projections, you know, our, our, our qualities that we tend to avoid or not like in ourselves. And also they can be positive projections, you know, they don't always have to be negative. So I've spoken quite a lot. Um, I, I suppose you're probably thinking, yeah. 
That's great, Cleana. What what we'd like to do is is identify yourself in terms of choosing your own money type with this poll right now. Did it show up okay, Cleana? Yes, it showed up fine. Great. Um, I can't see the results though. I think it's still it's still moving around at my end, so I think ah. people are still. <laughs> None of the above, all of the of the above. Janet says. It seems to have stabilized. All right, I'm gonna end. Well, it's still moving. It's settled again. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. All right, last last call. Okay, end the poll. Share the results. This is what we came up with. Oh, yeah. I totally thought we're going to be renunciates. Why? Because I was a renunciate for a long time till I started digging out my shadow. So I assumed everybody would be, you know, have the same influences of me, but not at all. 44% avoider. Clean, is there anything you'd like to say on this before I move on? I would say this is, it's interesting. It's pretty typical of groups that there is some unconscious avoidance always going on more or less with money. And uh, often we start a venture, we start a business or we have an idea and um, there is a lot of excitement around it. And then sometimes when it comes to the money, it can, the business can lose energy, you know, because the focus is on, not on life, it's on money. And it, because of the, because the unconscious is always in the driving seat, more or less. It sure is. And so the next slide is something for you that you can work on. It's like, it's an insight, it's a takeaway. Renata, if you pop up, put up the next one, whichever one that you ticked. And I know some people said, I'm a bit of two. So if you have a look at this. Uh, it's the next one. Yeah. This is a simple take start looking at. How can you... How can you have a more balanced relationship with money? Looking at your, your archetypal pattern, this is an approach you can take. The spender, be more disciplined, recognize what's motivating the spending. If I save, it doesn't mean that I'm selfish or greedy. And that means going into like what I think I'm trying to avoid being, which is greedy. Well, then let me go into that energy and expose that energy and welcome that part in as Cleona gave us the example of earlier. Very often spenders don't take care of their own needs because the, the compulsion to take care of others' needs overrides their own, their own and very often that's woven in with a, with a pattern of codependency. The saver, learn to enjoy my money and nourish myself. Know that there's always enough. Cleona, interrupt me at any time. The, re the renunciate, the one who doesn't want to touch money. Money itself is as neutral as the flow of air. It must be incorporated into a spiritual life in a healthy way. I like what you said, Thomas, in the chat, and you're absolutely right. You know, when I, so these, the saver, the avoider, I mean, the archetypes, this is sort of like a narrow way of, you know, but it just gives us a structure to have this conversation. We're not saying these are the only archetypes. Of course, there are probably dozens. Um, I think what this slide sort of points to is if you recognize that you're a spender, the next time you go like to the restaurant and you pay for everyone, you know, or you buy the first round, just experiment with doing the opposite. Like just sit there and take and take and take and take and don't do that. 
and see what happens in your body, see your reaction. Just it's it's called it's called just being curious, detective work, you know, sort of looking for clues in your behavior and ex experimenting with your edge. Um, for me, it was saying my hourly rate. <laughs> it makes, still makes me laugh and giggle when I say it because it's so ridiculous. It was like one thousand pounds an hour. I was like, oh my God, I cannot, I cannot, you know, I can, but, but it was just sort of telling a new lie and seeing what happens in my body. And uh, sometimes you'll be amazed that you might say something that actually you think is horrend horrific. Like I said, I'm a greedy uh, bastard as part of my reclamation. Uh, the first time, of course, there was some grief and there was like a, a lot of contraction. The second time I just giggled and laughed uncontrollably. There was delight in my body. There was a release of energy that was spontaneous and felt really good, you know? Um, so the idea with this is that all parts are welcome, very much like internal family systems, Dr. Richard Schwartz, all parts are welcome, all qualities are okay. What was you, Jack? Yeah, it's, it's I'm interested in um, some, the, the spiritual angle of where where we we see it from a from a divine perspective which very often denies hey we do have work to do here this is why it's an issue in money and spirituality we can't ignore it or avoid it you know renata i wonder could you take down that slide so that we can maybe open this up for discussion please feel free to put hands up folks and 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 so you know all aspects of our human life we have to take full responsibility for and that's what brings us into integrity and so we have to make peace with these things whether we like them or not um, and of course as we clear out our own stuff it becomes much more fluid and honest and open and it doesn't any longer hold an issue for us you know um, I see somebody there said uh, it's got abundance is so much more. I'm not sure where I saw it. Um, money is only one aspect. Money is abundance. only one aspect. Yeah, from yeah. Janet. And it's true because when myself and Cleona were talking about this last week, um, we were talking about abundance. One, one fantastic definition of abundance came from NVQ, the nonviolent nonviolent communication, NVC. Um, network where where they where they said that it's an ability abundance is an ability to mobilize your resources and there are so many more resources other than money and for me how I hear that is it's about the right use of power because us having you know an honest and open and respectful relationship with power is is what brings us into integrity and so uh, how do we how do we connect with the power that is in money how do we connect with it how do we use our own power do we mobilize our power you know in a healthy respectful way and when we are in a power up situation because we're in a leadership role we're more than 100 percent responsible we're more than 100%. We have to be. We have to be responsible for more than ourselves, more than our intention, because our impact in all walks of life is our responsibility too. And I think that's a lot of where, where problems within, within our communities, broader communities, have stemmed from. We've got to be responsible and respectful, mindful of our impact even when it comes down to money or teaching or guiding. It bleeds through all of it, how we use power and money is another power. And um, can I jump Please in? put your I hands up or we probably have a small enough. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. like when Jack and I were speaking, I was talking to her about uh, nonviolent communication and money and how uh, just as you said, Dr. Janet, that money, you know, money is only one way to meet needs. And um, when we embody the viewpoint that I have the power to mobilize resources to meet needs, it kind of moves me from contraction, like relationships or community or, you know, asking for favors or swapping or, 
there's, there's so much more creativity. And when I run these exercises in workshops and I get people to brainstorm different ways of meeting needs, there's such a like life force gushing in the room. There's such a like lively energy. Um, but of course, quite often, you know, uh, we fixate on money being the only way to meet needs. And, and also the reality, like uh, I live in the UK, you know, we have the NHS. In some countries, you don't have the same medical system. The reality is that you do need money to meet a certain amount of your needs. And so I just wanted to bring in that NVC aspect. Money is one way to meet needs. Uh, the other thing quickly, just to wrap up from my previous point is to say that um, to Thomas's point about the shadow, you know, like, like the, uh, the light, you can't have the shadow without the light. So when we do these reclamation work, uh, pieces of work, and I wish I could do it because when you see a demo and you actually see people's um, shift, it's very beautiful and it's very powerful because otherwise it sounds like, you know, mumbo jumbo, uh, but I've seen it and it's, it really works. And basically what you do is you reclaim the part that you're, that you have to be, or that you're avoiding, you know, like, like I have to be good, a good girl. I have to, you know, go and do this job. I, like I don't have options or I can't be greedy. You know, you, you work with, with those parts. And then if it's, a, if it's um, something where you're telling a story, like, like, you know, I must have a certain amount of number in my retirement account to be free. Then you remind yourself that you can have that quality that Thomas is pointing to the light, that you can have that security, that freedom with and without money, you know, but it's a body thing. We, we're not going to be able to get into it, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that um, what is helpful for you is just to see, you know, when you get really upset or triggered by people or there's resonance or there's numbness that alerts you to qualities. For example, um, I'll wrap up in five minutes, Jack. I told you once I get started. <laughs> okay. Uh, for example, like one time I, I did, you know, I, I had like a family constellations event at my home and somebody asked me if she could have a, a like a, a free, not free, but she said she would help me out. And she didn't help me out. There was a big pile of dishes. She did nothing and she left. And I was like furious and fuming. I had an extraordinary reaction to her not helping me. So that was a clue. Okay, so this is something that I need to look at within myself. And I brought it to this workshop leader that I work with. And my business is called Conscious Money. So of course, what do I disassociate from? Anything that's unconscious. And so my work was to sort of like, pretend like I'm a mushroom on a log of wood and to embrace my unconscious side because to me she was being ungrateful and unconscious. So the detective work is really useful, you know, when, when you either have like a strong resonance, if somebody says something and you feel, yeah, that's me too, or you have this extraordinary reaction, or you're also like completely checked out and numb, that's also interesting. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, yeah, over to you, Jack. Over to everybody. If you'd like to, there's 30 of us here. If you'd like to unmute yourself and let's see if we can go popcorn style. I'd like to hear your voices. And if you can try to make it about yourself, you know, rather than projecting what's wrong out there around money. Let's do the work and support each other, huh? Somebody else go first. <laughs> go for it, Jeffrey. Well, I don't have anything on my mind right now, but I'm sure somebody could spur me by saying something that I consider to be imbalanced and I'll correct it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll... Have... Go ahead. Sorry. I'll say something. I, I think teachers should be paid for their time. I think even spiritual teachers should be paid for their time a fair amount for their skill and their abilities. I wasn't speaking from a place of a universal principle. I was speaking from a place of, for me, I know that I would not put myself in that position of that tremendous potential for creating universal imbalance. 
Nadia, did you unmute yourself there? Yes, I, hi everyone. I just wanted to say I am not, uh, I don't provide the service. So I don't have the money issue when it comes to how to charge and all of that. But uh, I have like um, two sides with the money. So, so when you ask the first question about uh, what it, money is, my two sides spoke at the same time. So one said power and one said energy. <laughs> so, and, and that explains where I am in my spiritual process. I am, I, I, I am there, but there is a still what you call the shadow work and all the stuff. And I think uh, as a child, I was saying to myself, I make my own money. I'm not going to need anybody. And I think that's, that's the side that says power. And then there is the side that uh, money is uh, energy, it's the you know, universe expression, just like trees, like everything. And it comes when it comes, it goes when it goes. And I'm relaxed, I have faith about it. But I also have this, yeah, money, I make my money and kind of stuff. So just wanted to share that um, we are complex human beings. There will be like multiple sides to one human. Thank you. Yeah, and it changes too as we change doesn't it you know like we have different experiences and it'll turn our value system another direction you know and that's life it continuously evolves so you really to continually review and see how am i doing now you know so that we can stay as clear as we're able to that's true thank you Nadia. I'm not sure that we can untangle money from all of the other issues, some of them shadow issues of the teacher-student relationship. Because, and I, I was writing about this this morning. Um, some of you may know I, I write about shadow work. Um, you know, the, that relationship which we've all experienced, I assume, is based on unconscious projection or transference. And it is supported by cultural institutions in the lineages in which those relationships function. Like in Tibetan Buddhism, you vow not to criticize your teacher. I mean, that is a part of the vow. And the amount of financial coercion and abuse that's taken place. I agree with you, Jack, it doesn't get the press, but the amount of it, of people handing over their entire inheritance, of people working for decades for no payment, um, the amount of financial abuse is so epidemic, and I don't know how to sort of separate the threads from that transference relationship, the way teachers are empowered by the institute, by the systemic institutional settings, un going unquestioned. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, how to take this conversation in a way that is, for me, needs to be more psychological. I felt that in the last meeting as well. For me, there wasn't enough psychology to kind of poke around and come up with something. I thought I was gonna write about, for example, the ASI code of ethics, which I think is great. But the more that I delved into this, the more I realized these teachers feel impunity from codes of ethics. Buddhism has codes of ethics. Hinduism has yamas and niyamas. They're just, they're, they're discarded because of the grandiosity and the narcissism in these teachers. So these codes of ethics don't have any, don't carry any punch. So I don't have any solutions, but I'm, I'm hoping that this conversation can, for those of you who have any root in psychology, as well as spirituality, I'm hoping that the conversation can move more in that direction toward understanding these dynamics um, I mean, I've been there as a student. I also carry a lot of projection as a teacher. So I feel like I've experienced both sides. 
Rick and I have talked about this. I feel like I've experienced both sides of the projection. Um, that book I recommended on the chat, The Secret Life of Money, is really fabulous. It's about the mytholo mythological and archetypal stuff about money. Um, so I don't know. I'll, I'll just I'll land there, but that's kind of what I'm hoping for. I put a link in the chat to um, my interview with Lynn Twist, who wrote a book called The Soul of Money, which people might find interesting. Um, and, she, you know, she sees money very much as a kind of a spiritual energy, at least the way she has approached it. And she's done tremendous amount of good with it. Um, Jeffrey Turnbull's comment about there being something smelly and suspicious about any person who takes money while being a spiritual teacher. I've run into this before. Um, you know, I think obviously there, there's a spectrum and there are extremes and there are people, spiritual teachers who've done a lot of unethical things around money. Most of the people that I know who are spiritual teachers, um, you know, are not affluent by any means. And I don't expect them to work an eight, eight hour a day job and then somehow do their spiritual teaching gig in the evenings. I mean, you just don't have that much energy and time. So, yeah, I don't see whether there's anything unclean about you know, getting a reasonable amount of money for your spiritual teaching activities any more than there is for being a psychologist or a dentist or any other service that is valuable for people. Um, and I think maybe Jeffrey's sentiment arises from the misdeeds of some people who've abused this principle. Uh, but for the average person, um, you know, average spiritual teacher, is not independently wealthy and needs some kind of support. I wouldn't be doing backup anymore if, if not for a flow of donations. I, I would have burned out a long time ago. And as it is, when I started it, I was working a full-time job and doing backup stuff in the evening and weekends. And I didn't want to charge for it, but I wanted to grow it to the point where voluntary donations would enable me to ease off on the job and do backup full-time. But that's different than somebody who ha who is kind of like on the clock in terms of having consultations with people as a spiritual teacher, there's, there's not going to be that passive flow of income. And so I have no qualms whatsoever about interviewing such people or, you know, going to them if I wanted to go to them as a, you know, as a teacher, that's my, what I have to say. <laughs> I think there's a lot of examples out there of teachers who who don't charge enough are not able to charge enough or don't charge at all but their needs are not met um, Paramahansa Yogananda right close to his death he was writing letters looking for donations to try to keep his organization alive and to put that kind of pressure on teachers where they're not able to you know, not even setting up big organizations, but if you're not able to take care of your own needs, then that subtly bleeds into the work. We're responsible for our own needs. We've got to take control of how we earn a living. We have to do this. It's, it's basic self responsibility. And if we refuse to charge, our needs are just going to bleed into the work and it's a mess. And then we've got the psychology coming in, you know, exploitation of students and stuff. Wallace, I see your hand up there. Yeah, uh, I'm new to the group, you know. So what I say may or not, may or may not speak to the needs of the group, I'm not sure. But I'm engaged in an experiment <laughs> with money. <laughs> and uh, I have spent several years developing automated teaching systems um, on the internet that, can, that have been proven to deliver excellent spiritual teaching experiences for people. It's based on four years of research. And uh, what's interesting about it is that to work, it requires the assistance of a facilitator. So although everything's online, and people can can use it online, and it's 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 simple, simple enough to do. People need the facilitator there to hold their hand as they go through what is, in many cases, a life changing experience with this online training. And 
this has allowed me to experiment with creating community online where within the community people can offer themselves to be facilitators for others and we train them to do this and it's a simple enough training it's mainly communication skills simple communication skills so this and, and the online training is all done by qualified experts you know who are uh, and the main experience is online but the support is just you'd be amazed the loving attention of a facilitator I say it adds about 90% of you people get from the online experience. So what I've done is I'm making what, what I'm doing about us, not about me and the money I need, but about us and the money we need and what we need and more than money, the resources we need to make this community function. And I'm part of that picture as a spiritual teacher, you know, but it's about us. It's not about me. And uh, it's an experiment. <laughs> it's an experiment. It's going okay. It's still fairly early days. But my, my vision is that I will pull this off and that the community will prosper and I will prosper along with the community. And the other thing, interesting thing about it being online is it's very cheap to run because I can run this community for 100 euros or about 110 dollars a month you know <laughs> so it's very cheap to run so it's it's a fascinating experiment and the freedom it gives me as a spiritual teacher within that context to support people the way i want uh to meet their needs very precisely to allocate people to support them using the systems i have and the facilitators i have so the, the support network is very tailored to their individual needs. I'm loving it, you know, and it's it's absolutely fascinating and it has the merit of simplicity running right through it. Wallace, do you, do you have a donate system or how does this interface with money? Well, well, when people come into my service, if they're new, I invite them to participate, to become a participant in the, in the training experience for a month. And then at the end of the month, I would have a meeting with them it could be in a real world if it's in Dublin or online if it's not. And then I would, uh, at, at, at that meeting, I would explain to them, in fact, we would have a conversation, first of all, whether this path really suited them or not, and whether it was for them or not. And if it did really suit them, then at that meeting or shortly afterwards, I would take them through the part of the website that deals with how people can contribute to the community to make it work. And Do you have a set fee? Do you have a set fee or is it donation? Donation. Okay. It's donation and uh, how they contribute to the community and you can donate. Like some people would say, well, I, I can't really donate much money. I say, well, maybe you can donate something else. Maybe you can donate technical support or some other aspect of what the community needs and i've made it about us and our sure. need and not about me and my money needs you know yeah thanks wallace i think it's you know it, it, it there there is that energy around when we're called to be a spiritual teacher there is a dedication to service and it's about the teachings but at the same time there there are these human needs that that we need to satisfy and like when I lived in Ireland also Wallace is living in Dublin and Ireland there as he said I lived off donation moved to the US didn't happen and so we've got this cultural context also to to take into consideration you know Kleena would you like to come in there I mean I, I think Leona would you like to come in there yeah I like I like what you said Wallace and that you're you're clear and you're in in integrity with what you're trying to create and you're the source of a beautiful idea. Uh, for me, uh, like I can only speak from my experience. I experiment with what feels good to me, but I'm not a spiritual teacher. I certainly don't judge people who ask for money. I think it's important to ask for money to meet your needs but you don't do the work for money. You do the work because you want to do the work and you just ask for enough money to meet your needs, you know. But that enough question is a big one because if we've got 
uh, loaded in our ancestry with scarcity, famines, you know, wars and all of that stuff. This conditioning of scarcity is so huge that we just, we don't know what is enough. And that fear drives us, you know. So I also have compassion for people who are out of touch with, with that and keep, you know, accumulating. That's all I have to say. Oh, and when I charge, I try to find an amount that like is delightful for the other person to pay. And sometimes we have an awkward conversation about it, you know, because sometimes the money I want to ask for is not what the other person wants to give me. But if I really want to ask to work with that person, then the relationship is more important than the money. The money is just there to facilitate flow. I don't want it to be transactional. Yeah. Julie, I see your hand up. Um, um, there are so many angles from where you can view all of this. Um, I feel um, from a standpoint of a person who goes to a spiritual teacher that at some point you're really ready to pay for a service. And I'd say for, for an example, uh, if, I'm, if I'm a life coach and I accept people that are not willing to pay and find a, a way to pay. And I like the donation, uh, the, the multi-level. If someone has more money or less money, you can change the price. At some point you can get abused also by people that are really just looking for free time. <laughs> so there are both ways where in respect for your own work and for also um, attracting or, or working with people that are really commit something. They show up on time, they pay a fee. And of course, the enough question is really a big question like uh, Cleona was saying. So I'm unable to say that something is good or bad, either from the client perspective or from the teacher perspective. And I like the fact where we see more and more a scaling. So you can say, if you're able to pay more, you pay more and you can judge that on your own capacity. And um, my trust is that some teacher that are making a lot of money, some of them are really enabling people that are, are not able to pay to join as well. So I'd lean on the side of trust, but I don't know the spiritual uh, history. So, yeah. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Yeah, the sliding scale piece is, is important. I think a lot of spiritual teachers are moving that way. Yeah, Phil. Um, I uh, first need to excuse myself because I moved to the country for the quiet and now my neighbor is mowing his lawn. So <laughs> I, I hope it's not too intrusive. Um, I, I wanted to say something earlier, but the, the um, conversation took uh, the, a, a welcome turn. It got much more balanced. Um, I, I was going to say it's very easy to um, call something abuse or exploitation, but it gets very nuanced just as, as we make excuses for real exploitation and are often in denial about it, the opposite can happen too. Some people make conscious, mature, grown-up decisions to donate tons of money to a cause that they uh, believe in and approve of. And often it puts them in conflict with family and other people who think they're being exploited. Uh, Jack mentioned Yogananda. Well, I can tell you, having seen the letters, that he, he was practically begging some of his wealthy devotees to rewrite their wills and to assure the uh, ongoing continuity of the organization that he created. And because one of them stepped up and did that, 
that organization survives and we have autobiography of a yogi and all that. His family was not that thrilled. I mean, it goes back, even Swami Vivekananda in the early part of the 20th century, a wealthy follower bequeathed a big chunk of her money to his work. And uh, after she died, her uh, daughter contested the will and the jury ruled in the daughter's favor that no sane person would give money to a Hindu monk and she must have been hypnotized by the Swami. Uh, you know, she was a, a very wealthy, prominent Bostonian uh, woman who would have been appalled if she'd known what happened. So these things get very complicated. And we need to think about the circumstances and what the money is being used for. And uh, if it's being used for good, if it's, if it's being uh, requested in a, a dignified way with integrity or people are being coerced, uh, it, gets, it gets nuanced. And we have to deal with it in our own small minor league way uh, as well. So that's my two cents. Yeah, it's huge. The topic is huge. It's, oof. Anybody want to comment on Phil or do we move on? I noticed Julie had her hand up and then I think it's down now. But... Chris has his hand up. Hi. Uh, and I'm, I, so clear, I'm also from India, so and I'm a two-time cult survivor. So I think I ended up giving uh, whatever little meager savings I had to my first spiritual teacher before I found out that he was a sex addict. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I do remember one thing, <clears throat> not wanting to throw the baby out with the bath water. He was very good with money. And uh, one of the things that I've always seen with the Indian spiritual teachers who were really good is that uh, they were either natural salespeople or they made it a big effort to go and learn selling. Right? So uh, you'd be surprised whether it's Sadhguru or uh, Mahesh Yogi, all of these people have taken some form of selling courses. All right. It may not be, uh, it's not that they may have gone for a Dale Carnegie course, but they did take their time to learn selling from other people. And I think initially the motivation was that when you want to attract a group of people, you need to present the ideas in such a way that the ideas are attractive. So that's where they started off with. And then they realized that with that, they're able to, you know, attract the people and then attract the money uh, going forward. Uh, I'm personally financially free. I, I, I find that a little bit of a problem nowadays because uh, until I had to worry about money, uh, I would get up. Now that I don't have to worry about money ever again, I find it difficult to get up some mornings. You know, like what am I getting up for? So that's a very different kind of a problem that I face. My, uh, one of my spiritual mentors made it a point to send me to Debtors Anonymous when I was uh, creating and I found that very, very helpful, particularly when I was overspending a lot. And he was very particular about uh, explaining to me and he pulled out a set of notes from his uh, wallet and he said, hold the notes. And I held the notes and he said, this is the physical gross energy. And he said, the Kundalini is, is far more slippery and more subtle and it's vapor, you know. If you can't handle something solid, how would you handle something which is in the domain of vapor? And I'm like, Okay, that's a nice lesson. I mean, I'm not sure if the metaphor is very accurate, but it stuck with me for a long time. So that's my two cents that I wanted to share. That I have made it a point to learn from my teachers how to sell, and uh, I only used one book in terms of learning how to get my finances in order. That was a book called The Richest Man in Babylon. So yeah. I read that book and I followed that book uh, rigorously. Uh, I think it's very, very sensible. Uh, it's very difficult, like my friend would say, it's very difficult to not be financially okay if you follow a set of principles consistently. So that's my two cents. Thank you. 
I I love listening to your accent, Chris, uh, Krish, and uh, I just wanted to say like uh, I I used to do vipassana or goenka style before I discovered the shortcut of non-duality, where I'm already that. <laughs> and uh, in the goenka retreat, uh, goenka says. In India, there are more guru, there are as many gurus as there are monsoon frogs hopping around everywhere. <laughs> and it used to crack me up each time. <laughs> Actually, uh, to be very honest, when I come to the Europe or the United States and I see my fellow Indians taking uh, the country people for it, it's really embarrassing. Those are the times I do not want to declare anything to do with my spiritual heritage. I just tell them I'm a life coach and I leave it at that because it is a little embarrassing to see uh, the um, the innocent innocence of a spiritual seeker being exploited by these uh, people. And that's quite uh, disheartening. And uh, as a psychologist, I also realize that uh, that's the spiritual disillusionment is one of the most difficult cases to uh, treat uh, in, a, in a psychological uh, clinic per se. It's, that's the most difficult form of work. Somebody gets spiritually disillusioned because of the teacher. That's that's the worst form of uh, you know mental imbalance, and I suppose the worst form of karma the teacher can ask for himself. And it's it's easy, you know, with so much spiritual bypassing going on and just lack of spiritual maturity maturity among us spiritual leaders. You know, it's easy to use any sentence to to push it back on the student that it's their ego, that it's their issue, which is a horrendous, rife, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say practice or habit, habit, tradition that's going on for eons. Um, and it, it means that the teacher isn't taking responsibility, just not taking responsibility for their impact isn't open to feedback, you know, and like, uh, was it Connie that was saying earlier, you know, the Zen tradition around you can't criticize your teacher. It's like, well, what about teachers taking feedback? What about that human exchange where we're more responsible for, for, for the impact we have? There's, there's a whole other area of honesty and transparency that isn't yet in, in many teacher-student relationships. So I think we got to go there. I, I want to speak to that because I'm not very sure. I think it's, uh, I'm just speaking from my limited knowledge of Buddhist tradition, but the third principle is uh, Sangam Sharnam Gachami, which is I take refuge in the community. So I'm not sure how uh, the condition that you would not criticize your teacher got evolved because there is a traditional practice where you bring forth your concern to the council and you don't address it to the teacher and the council of elders or the council of senior teachers then discuss it and do it because they give protection to the junior monk who's bringing up the concern per se. So the, I, I'm not sure if there's a dilution and I do have a few friends in a, a couple of Buddhist monasteries. So I'm going to keep it a point to really check if that's the tradition or it's got diluted along the way because that's something I'm, completely taken by shock. I think no Buddhist monk is safe if he can't criticize his teacher, then I think no Buddhist monk is safe. Let's, let's focus on that. I want to check that out. And feedback is a, is, a, is a beautiful way to communicate where both are growing and both are sharing. It doesn't, it doesn't have, you know, an alignment with criticism necessarily at all. That's one route we could take. Janet, I noticed that you've shared a lot in the uh, in the chat box. Would you like to speak? And I'm looking at your backdrop: planetary peace, power, prosperity. <laughs> You're covering a lot there. Yes, and it's very. If you start going into details and stories, it's extremely complex and also very fascinating to explore. Um, I don't think I do want to speak other than what I put in the chat. I'm listening carefully to the conversation, all the words being thrown around here and respecting them all. 
And, and yeah, I, I don't have anything I want to add in particular. Uh, now, I will add one thing. Just think about a couple of words that have been put out into the world. Um, T.S. Eliot's The Still Point from his four quartets, the first of the four quartets, I think, the still point of the turning world. Can we stay in that? And um, then Ram Das is be here now. Just be here now. And then make the choices that you need to make in each and every moment to benefit both yourself and those around you to the best of your ability. None of us is perfect. <laughs> and, uh, that's all I'll say right now. And can I add on with a willingness to continually learn, grow and evolve as we do so? Thank you, Janet. If nobody else wants to speak right now, is there anybody who, oh, David, oh no, that's, that's not a hand up, okay. Uh, Renata, can you pop up? Um, there's just a couple of slides in, that are going to be shown now in order to just throw up a gut response of, of uh, let's see if we can find something. Next one. All right, what's the answer to this that you would put, the end to the sentence that you might put in the chat box? Financially rich people are, so like wealthy people are. How would you finish that sentence? <laughs> All over the map, just like me. Spiritually ready. All different. Financially rich people are curious. They're the good, the bad, and the ugly. Fun, intelligent, clever. Experts at making money, that's all. Potentially big contributors, all set financially. Hmm. Yeah, financially rich people are financially rich. That's great. No way to describe in one sentence. Fortunate, yeah. They have an opportunity to be at ease regarding survival and mobility. <laughs> Who knows? Renata, can you pop up the next, finish your sentence? What's the ending of this sentence? Financially poor people are Destitute, just like me, not good at making money. Need help, see the world differently. In need of money. <laughs> Often somewhat frozen and stifled. All sorts of people. All different. Possibly in a tough place. More to learn to be respected. They're quite diverse. Do not identify self, but they're unbalanced holistically. They're often women with children, limited, uninterested in money and cramped in their self-expression. They need education on prosperity. Thank you, Renata. Can you take down that one? Cleona, would you like to, um, oops, just take down that one. That's the last one. <laughs> Cleona, can you, would you, would you like to add something there or we can go just into the last yeah, slide? Please go. Yeah, yeah, please go. Okay. Can you make that big screen there again, Renata? Thanks a million. Okay, teachers who charge a lot are, be honest folks, 
finish the sentence. Teachers who charge a lot are lacking in creativity, greedy, comfortable with charging a lot, okay for those who can afford it. Some are ambitious, some are greedy. They're allowed to do so. They're limiting their work. Some abuse their power. They come in all forms, makes it not available to everyone. They're all over the map. Have a responsibility to give back. They need to give value for their money. They're exploiting others, may be responsible for others in their organization, travel expenses, so it's justifiable. Depends on their intentions for using the money flow. They are enabled. Not primarily interested in elevating or serving the human family in entirety. They probably don't think they're charging a lot. Renata, can you take down that um, slide, please, and go back to seeing each other's lovely faces? Cleona, would you like to, to come in there? Yeah, I mean, it's heavy, isn't it? Like uh, spiritual abuse. I too, like Krish, uh, gave money away in my 20s to a guru who promised me magical experiences and bliss and, you know, uh, and then wanted to lay her hands on me and called me the reincarnation of Mary Magdalene and all kinds of shit that I believed in my 20s. Um, what I wanted to say was, I mean, like just acknowledging that there is a lot of trauma around money, you know, there is, there is just a lot of it. Um, from this, from the teaching of Peter Koenig, which has helped to free me in my own condition, my personal conditioning around money. And I find that the more free I am, the more I can interact within money systems with a certain element of freedom, knowing that the money systems are not idealistic, you know, they are pretty flawed and they don't work for everyone's needs but the two the two things that I wanted to say is money can be whatever I want it to be so I can consciously tell the story about money that works for me you know and if I want money to be evil then if that works for me that's fine I can consciously tell the story and I would rather tell profitable stories because I like money uh, and I, I want to use it in my in my in my in my life and I do things with it that helps, that is helpful. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is when we reclaim these projections onto spiritual teachers about greedy and pricing and all of this stuff, you know, then if we've reclaimed our own greedy path, then it's easy to call it out when we see it because we've reclaimed our own greedy path. So it's just another greedy person acting greedy and you don't have like a big, you know, the, the reaction the big reaction isn't necessarily there. You can just call it out. It's like, hey, you're being greedy, you know? It's, um, I don't know how to, exp I don't know if I'm expressing that clearly, but, but basically the more inner work that we do in freeing up our own shadows, the more free we can be to call out other people's shadows and also not accept their projections or accept their projections as the case may be. Um, I was on a spiritual retreat. I told Jack about it. Uh, earlier last year and there was some abuse and I actually received a lot of the projections from the group the group were all into bliss love and light and the teacher called me aggressive and in my head I was like I am aggressive and I love it what's wrong with being aggressive you know so there was the other thing about embracing your shadows is you become harder to trigger because the words that people use to attack you are words that you can embrace because you're like I am that and what else? Of course, I'm aggressive. Of course, there are times when I want to be aggressive. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. David, you have a hand up. You're okay? Ah, okay. I know. I want to go back. I want to, I had to unmute. <laughs> I want to go back to something you said early on. You were quoting from one of the articles. And it was that the research that you saw was far more about uh, sexual and physical abuse in spiritual communities than about financial abuse. And thinking about all of these 
this questioning that's going on in our community about this, the unease or the, un, the feeling that the question about money is more ambiguous. Whereas the idea of, in our culture, um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, although obviously we've seen a lot of wishy-washy cases, nonetheless, these are not acceptable practices. But when you look at the financial and business structures, there is a great deal of activity that the average person considers abuse that they just call, it's just business. And ways of dealing with it through the, through the legal establishment that allow them to do things that other people would feel are definitely abuse. So it seems like in the spiritual community, we have that feeling that there's a great deal of this kind of abuse that goes on in the formal um, business and, and uh, financial systems that we want to pull back from and not be identified with. Whereas I think at least at the, at the general level, none of us are going to support the idea of sexual or physical abuse. Whereas the financial abuse seems more ambiguous because so much of it is done in the general community. Yep, yep. And it, it, it reflects back to how diverse our um, conversation was at the last webinar. And, and can we find a good, honest, a uh, way of walking forward in relation where, where we're in alignment with what makes sense for us. It's, that's, you know, a bit cleaner, but look at this conversation, even pulling this in, you know, it's so complex. There is so, there are so many nuances as Phil was saying around this issue, especially with the culture of donation. We've got this added complexity in the culture of spiritual leadership because of the donation culture, which is, you know, the tithing, all that was there, like the collective supports the teacher, not the, not the charge at the door. The collective is, well, you've got to take care of them. Somebody, you've got to give them, you know, a room in your house. You've got to support your teacher. And that, that, that's a cultural specific pattern and it doesn't work in every culture. And I'm not sure it needs to continue really. It's, it's very complex. And so what we wanted to do today was like throw it open, encourage each of us to ask some questions about our own relationship with money. How does that impact with how we see money spiritually? And I think the last slide was rather telling, you know, teachers who earn a lot. It's like, okay, how much of it is that actually a reflection of our own pushback against people who charge more than what we might have the courage to do so? But, but that might be, it might be about us having the courage to do so, but it might be about us, we don't need to do that. And it's not an integrity for us to charge that high rate. Which is it? Which is it? And only we can answer that for ourselves. It's about that introspection to see, am I scared that people will say, oh my God, you're a total, you know, greedy bastard. Don't be charging that rate. What's wrong with you? Like, is that, are we scared of that repercussion of being seen that way? Are we just protecting our self-image? Is that what's monitoring our rate or our, our preference for donation only? Like there's a lot of stuff that goes on here. And all, I, all we can do really is like, hey, let's open this can of worms and each honor what we need to figure out for ourselves. As we draw to a close, Cleona, would you like to add anything? I was just gonna copy the resources in the chat box for people. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you for sharing and for being honest. And, and uh, we want to encourage everybody from an ASI perspective to do our own work. And I hope that there is something a little bit uncomfortable going on for each of us so that we can do some more inner work and, and get some more insights into our own relationship with money and how that shows up in our work and in the wider landscape. We're responsible yes. for, for our own relationship with money. So let's take ownership. 
thank you everybody um please keep an eye on the next newsletter and we'll hope to see you all at the next uh webinar thank you for joining us <laughs>